And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Discami Publishing, most recently known for Anime 5e, and now with and now with what I'm going to be calling the Tristat Trinity, because I love alliteration, of three mint of three mi of three micro Tristat games in on one Kickstarter campaign, that being Pixies, Worms, and Demonicity. See, I got it right this time. <laughs> the one and only, Mar the the head haunt show of Discami, Mark McKinnon. How you doing tonight, man? Hi, Mel. Good, good. Thanks for having me on once again. It's great to be here. Thank you for thank you for coming. Thank you for coming right along. Um, so we'll delve we'll delve into the in, into the individual projects in their in their own time. But first off, first off, how did this whole, how did this whole idea of doing three micro games um, come about? Yeah, well, during the uh, the the lockdown that much of the world was on, I had a lot of time to do some designing, and we had tr transitioned away from you know through Bessem and Bessem Fourth Edition. That was the kind of the revitalization of the TriStat system, and it presents a multi-genre universal system that that's really big. It has to be big and comprehensive because it has to handle everything. And so because of that, it can be a little daunting for people that are looking for something a little more focused and immediate. There's a lot of creation you need to do. It We give you the tools, and it's a great toolbox, but it doesn't give you a lot of kind of pre-made furniture. It's kind of like an Ikea set is what Bessem 4th Edition, that version of TriStat is. And when we ended up hiring robin flanagan to work on absolute power which is the superhero version of the tristat system and that's going to be taking it kind of to the next level and during that that space between best and fourth edition and absolute power when that comes out there was a fair amount of design time that i had and i was looking at tristat and thinking well can we what, what if you wanted to run a specific genre whether it's whether it's anime or not but if you want to run something very specific, the TriStat system, while it's a that giant toolkit that I mentioned, mm -hmm. you can make it much more smaller and intimate if you're running something specific. And so while Bessem or the base TriStat is the everything, these three mini games are expressions of the TriStat system that I wanted to present something that was a, a setting with characters, with some really short, brief scenarios, something that was focused that you can take and you can pick up and run right away for two or three hours with a bunch of friends on a, on a Friday night, virtually, if it's, you know, if there's physical distancing involved or around the gaming table, if you're playing that way, something that was able to, to get going right away. And so that's where it started. And when Pixies was my initial one that I wanted to move into, I thought the idea of watching, uh, the Secret of Arietti and the Borrowers and all these cute shows about these little creatures that run around, uh, Secret of Nim, like that that idea was very captivating. And so I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to have a game where you're playing those little creatures? So that was the first expression. And then from there, after I was working on the design, I realized, wow, what else can I do in stretching the TriStat system in different ways? And that's when I thought, well, if I'm going to be really small with Pixies, why not go really big with playing dragons? And then Demonicity was kind of the, the mid-range that came from there. And so I was looking at ways to take the generic universal TriStat system and give very specific genre applications. And because of that, the games are much, much smaller than base TriStat because they're so focused. So that, that's kind of a, a summary of, of how that came along. A lot of it was just having design time on my hands because I was sitting at home and not uh, you know meeting up with people. All right. I, I, can, I, can, certainly, uh, I can certainly get that. When... Now, this uh, obviously this isn't the fir this isn't the first time the idea of taking Tristat and slimming it down has been c has been considered because um, shortly after Be shortly after Besom launched, there was that alternate version of Besom Naked, which I still have no plans to review. <laughs> um, <laughs> but did the but did this pr did did for the time being? I'm g like I said, I'm going to call it the Tristat Trinity. Did that particular idea come? Um, when it came to actually getting the crunch down of it, was some of it loosely inspired by what you were doing with Naked? The 
I guess some of the kernels probably came from there. The the difference is, I guess, is, is Tristat Naked or Bessem Naked mm -hmm. is the same game in its level of comprehension, the amount of options. It's the exact same game as the Bessem 4th edition, the base version of Tristat. Mm -hmm. The wording was just changed a little bit. Where uh, when I looked at that, I said, well, if I can take a 350-page book and bring it down to 144 pages, like two to three times smaller but keep the system the exact same what can i do if i actually reduce the system and removed options that aren't important like if you're playing pixies and the the nature of your playing these little creatures that are living in a house well there's lots of different options that you do not need to have you don't need to have an entire section on guns for example uh you don't need to have all of these different psionic abilities and and whatnot the supernatural powers because that's not what the setting is about and so yeah naked and maybe was the first kind of iteration where it stripped down some of the text but kept the system and then the next step was then stripping down the system down to the core elements that you need to actually run the game yeah and given given these given these size i'd admit I could easily imagine that it was a bit was a bit of a daunting challenge to to um take take the take the even some even something like naked is is not is no slouch when it comes to page count and taking that and going and slimming it all the way down to 32 pages as as it's noting on the Kickstarter um I'd imagine must have been daunting and were there were there certain things that that were con that could be considered staples of Tristat that um that had that had to be that had to be pared down to compensate or was it mainly skimming down the attributes and defects yeah and and the options i mean certainly the attributes and defects list if there's a hundred of them in base tristat best and fourth edition mm -hmm. there's probably close to the 10 or 12 of them in pixies uh, because you know that the book is going to be one tenth the size because you have one tenth the number of options of the characters but there's certain aspects that when you're, you're presenting a complete role-playing game you have to cover your basics we still have the tristat system so there's still body mind and soul as your your base uh, core features so we still have to address that and then we still have your derived values like the idea of, of going with your your health uh that has to be there how do you des determine your combat and that has to be there and so while it's certainly paring things down there's no doubt about it there we couldn't get away from the core system if you're creating a core rpg you have to have your your base features your advanced features and then how to run the game whether it's how do you get into a fight how do you roll you know do your stat checks and your stat uh skill checks and all of those different aspects that are important for a game but of course the number of options is going to be reduced down so you don't need to have this section about called shots and grappling and, and all the great features that are for a really robust, comprehensive, universal, generic tristat system, which Bessem 4th edition is. Mm -hmm. None of that needed to be in Bessem when you're playing something lighter and more fun and a little bit more hand wavy. Uh, so there was elements we had to keep, but other elements we could we could certainly drop or, or change. Mm -hmm. Now, Based on based on the based on the bullet points of what of what's in it, so a thirty page a thirty two page book, six um, story scenarios, six um, player player characters, and and a set and a set of dice. Um, the vibe the vibe that I get with each with each of these is much is much more akin to to the old to the old to the old setting box sets that you would see for certain settings of say. Um, A D and D, or or some of the box sets for say, um, Shatter Zone. J just to just to give a few examples, was th was that the was that kind of the framework that you were going with? Yeah, uh, absolutely. You you got that right. I mean, certainly the Bessem game, which would started out back in 1997 when we did it, was a 96 page book and it was a small digest size. And since then, it's gone from 96 pages to 350 pages, and it's much more comprehensive. That was what we wanted to have a, a big, robust, comprehensive system in Bessem 4th edition. Mm -hmm. But this was designed to be that throwback feel of where I got started with my role playing, which was the old red box set of Dungeons and Dragons, where you had your your basic and your expert. And the, these box sets, they had the dice included, and they had your rule book and the little adventure. So we took inspiration for what they are. Now, that's not to say that they're not currently being done. Like, you can get an, the adventure introductory box set right now for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Mm -hmm. 
But my my feeling of what I was going for was the throwback to where I got started. And that's where I kind of wanted to give that a little bit of an homage where you're going to have your pre-generated characters. You're going to have your the, the dice included and these little short little adventure scenario outlines that you can start playing right away and have some fun with it. So, yeah, you you nailed it. That was exactly what we we're going for is that kind of comprehensive introductory set, not introductory in the sense of we're going to teach you how to role play, because I think that is a, a level that is actually more complex than something that's simple like you have to be really really focused if you're going to be an introduction to role playing but this would be an introduction on if someone already knows how to role play here's how you can just jump in and get started right away with the game and and we provide everything in the box for that yeah so with that with that kind of thing in mind let's go let's go into a little bit more detail a little bit more on the ground when it comes to the individual components that make up the this um tristat trinity and we'll start off with um, Pixies. Now, I th would it be fair of me to say that when it came to these three ideas, Pixies was the one that came first? Yeah, de definitely. And actually, I had played a game that was uh, a similar title, Pixie, back in the early 90s, back when I was, you know, before I got into publishing. And it was this cute little indie game that I had. And I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. And and it was kind of taking that inspiration from there. And if I was going to do uh, an application of a, a quick, fun, simple game, Pixies, that, that concept of playing the, the people that live in, in the between the walls in your house, mm -hmm. that to me was, was just very evocative of a role-playing setting. And so that certainly came first that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I, will, I will admit that something something that I find amusing is that First off, when I when I saw the setup for Pixies, I, the name that immediately came to mind was the Borrowers, and I, I see yeah. that as one as one of the um, one of the other names for Pixies li listed in there. So that's one reference in there. But the other is um, a game that a video game that I've been fo that I've been following that I think would fit in naturally with something like Pixies is Small Saga. And while that one is that one is going is leaning a little bit towards Secret of Nim, while while, st while still doing traditional RPG approaches to the point where, say, the pyromancer in the part in the party in that his focus is just a Zippo lighter, <laughs> and the and the and the fighter who's supposedly who's supposed to be wielding a cloud style great sword is just wielding a pocket knife, <laughs> um. It's in it's in that same look that same little vibe of t of taking the taking the mundane and make and making it appear um, threatening. Um. Yeah, and that that certainly with I mean this is this isn't an original idea. I don't I don't try to claim any kind of originality like the more like the the borrower secret of Arietti, uh and and even those old. Uh, cartoons from Disney, like the the Secret of Nim, where you're playing the the small creatures. There's lots of of movies where there's animals that kind of talk and and you can work from there. And I wasn't really going for the animal angle. Uh, I think going with small humans, which is effectively where the pixie idea. There's still something magical in there, but it's it's not an original idea. But I think it's a great idea for doing a, a role playing scene. Um, and give now. Given given that given that, um, it does there does seem, there does seem to be a would it be fair to say that one of the underlying themes when it comes to pixies is these very live in the mo these very live in the moment flight of fancy kind of kind of characters having to adapt to more um, modern houses and modern and modern styles of environment. Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly an angle you can take. I mean the one of the the way we believe people should be kind of probably introducing the game is everyone plays a pixie and you're arriving at a new house to take over. Like you you have to make this house your own. And often that is a great initial starting point of you're getting to the new house. So there's humans living there and of course the pixies being amoral, not immoral, but amoral. They just don't have that same moral structure and they just know what they want and and they're going to move into the house. But of course, there's going to be cats or, or other animals there, birds, for example, as well as the humans, and they have to maintain ownership of it. The interesting thing about this pixies aspect is that normal humans don't see, when they see a pixie, 
they actually don't see the pixie for what it is. They will see a small animal. Their, their, their adult minds just can't comprehend that there's this pixie in front of them. So they'll see pixies at mice or squirrels or whatnot. And that is kind of playing with the, the little bit of a fairy tale and fantastic elements. Whereas children, children will see the pixies for actually what they are. They're, they haven't lost their innocence so, so they can see the magic of what it is. And I think that's that's a really sweet and great place to start a campaign uh, or start a game. But that's not to say that's where the limitations are. You can play the the, the kind of the conflicts or the the interactions between the innies and the outies. You know, pixies that live in houses versus pixies that live in in gardens or whatnot. And how does that conflict uh, conflict come up? And then you have all the the potentials for the animal conflicts, whether it's crows or cats or dogs, and how does that play out? So there's lots of different ways you can explore with that but but i think the the baseline is probably going to be pixies interacting with humans when they first move into a house that'll be a very common setting mm -hmm. um something that i couldn't help but notice and it, ga and it gave me a bit of a chuckle um in one of the recent updates you showed a couple examples of character sheets um mm -hmm. and the one with pick the one with pixies when i saw when i saw that and i saw the dots out my my mind immediately went to um to the old to the old world of darkness type of type of character sheet although this one has more details than some of those sheets did i can say that much <laughs> um what was when designing when designing the character sheet was that was that a bit of an influence or is that coincidence on my part no, no, that was certainly an influence. I mean, the old uh, Vampire the Masquerade and Mage and whatnot, you know, filling in the little dots, that, that's just fun. And yeah. we haven't done that before with Bessem because it was much more comprehensive as Tristat. We kept everything a lot more generic, and we don't know, like, each campaign might have different levels. So if you're playing a human-level campaign in, in Tristat, the base Bessem, you're going to be at a different scale than if you're at playing superheroes with absolute power. And so it didn't make sense for us to kind of have the, the base generic universal system fill into those roles of these little dots. But with Pixies, we know the parameters that are that people are going to be filling in. We, we have a very defined, limited structure, and you're playing with, with inside a certain box. And because you're playing within that box, and you're not going to be going outside there with your characters, we could create a character sheet that reinforced what we were going for so those those little fill in the dots they're they're just fun yeah um now uh, although to to your credit um because of because of how much lighter something like this is you're not going to end up with the same problem that um world of darkness has ha has had and the and this is and this will be a bit of a shameful confession for me i have never used the, I've never used the official character sheet with any World of Darkness game I've ever played. I've always used customs like the ones that Mr. Gone would make, uh, sim simply because the default with just with just one page just didn't cut it. But th but that's not going to be a problem that Pixies would have. Yeah, it's obviously certainly much, much simpler. You're only going to have a few different things filled out. Obviously, you're going to have your three stats, but you might only have two or three attributes that you're going to work with, maybe one defect and, and a handful, a small handful of skills because the characters are, are so much simpler. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, when it comes to what, when it comes to, um, what it, what's going to be, what's going to be able, what you're going to be able to access. I do appreciate that all of the attributes, defects, and skills are, fl are flat out listed, um, on, on the sheet. I'm always a fan of the whole play from the sheet kind of philosophy. Um, but w are there in, are there any are there any specific kind specific kind of um, mechanical difference differences or mechanical focuses that are that are highlighted within Pixies? Yeah, not not with Pixies. Some of the other games have a, a some slight variations of what we're doing, but Pixies is a much. It's almost like you take core tristat and you just simplify it down. So it still has attributes, still has defects, still has skills in a very simple, straightforward way. Everything fits on the character sheet because it's there's no surprises in Pixies. You're you're playing within a very limited structure of what those characters can do. There, there's not a lot of variation between you can have your your big and strong Pixie or your smart and maybe a little bit of magical Pixie, but your the, the diversity of characters is not nearly as strong as you would get in in some of the other games that we have. And so everything fits on just that one character sheet. Um. Uh, now give now. Given that, given that, since since with when it comes to 
when it comes to the kind of setup with Pixie's um, style of sto style of story. Um, now I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you to go through all of them, but I'd like you to give me an example of what a story what a story scenario for Pixies would look like. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the very first story scenario with, that we kind of recommend is the arrival at the new house. Mm -hmm. And so you are your group of characters, however many players. It could just be one, but Polly works better with a you know group of two to six. And you're showing up at a house. You had left your other house for whatever reason or your, your outdoor living quarters, whatever that was. You've left that. You're moving on. And here's this house. And there's this family that lives inside. And there's a cat. And there's a teenager. It's kind of like a little bit of a lackadaisical teenager. you got this super energetic little kid. You're going to have uh, the, the cat who's going to be very aggressive. And then you have the parents who are far too busy to pay attention to their kids appropriately and whatnot. And then it's the hijinks that is, is, ensue from there. So you have to get into the house. You have to kind of break in, find a way in. Then you have to start setting up your, your establishment while trying to avoid the humans and the cats and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then it's getting introduced to the type, type of things that would happen on a regular basis. So there is a, a play test that we ended up running where there's this party going on and you know the, the teenager kid, the parents are out, teenager kids running a party, everyone's getting high and, and drinking and whatnot. And so if someone sees a pixie, they're actually going to see the pixie for what it is. Normally they can't, but when you're you know on narcotics, you're actually going to see the reality of what these pixies really are. And, and how does that play out? And, and what are the characters going to do as the pixie? you want to stop people from ruining your furniture you want to stop the cat uh, from hunting you and whatnot and what kind of measures do you take and you can go as dark or as playful as you want it could be very very light or you can start setting up the idea of actually you know killing the cat how do you set it up so you're going to eliminate this threat permanently um, what are you going to do the teenager if they're a bit of a problem are you going to try to eliminate them permanently in some way or is it going to be kept really really light we, we don't set the the default of how people are want to play but that initial scenario is that kind of first introduction to the new family and how do you interact from there mm -hmm. all of our scenarios that we have are are very short, very brief. These aren't your your full on adventures with with meeps and and all of that. That that this is not the type of game for that. This is much more super light. Here's a couple of beats in the in the scenario that you want to take in consideration. But where you go with it is completely up to you because we we don't prescribe what's going to happen. We just kind of give the outlines of this is the scenario and how do you interact is is going to be very improvisational with you and the players. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I'd like to sh I'd like to shift gears a little bit to cover worms, which yeah. I could I could see I could see some bit some bit of a a bit of a daunting aspect with the worms. So, first off, the idea of doing a uh, doing a um, setup all inv all involving dra all involving dragons fighting other dragons to try and con to try and consume each other's hearts. Um, I'll get the obvious joke out of the way. I w I was very tempted to make a to make a Highlander reference when I was reading it. <laughs> well, the, the, this is very much it is is Dragon Highlander Voltron in in many ways. You have these these like you said there can only be one. Mm -hmm. the, these dragons are designed to hunt each other down and kill each other, but in the end these dragons are actually just part of the larger worm. And so a worm is, is a giant beast who can then divide into multiple pieces into these dragon or dragon kin. They could be wyverns or they can be the more Eastern dragons, which we call uh, Ryu. And so that's where the, this kind of Voltron aspect comes in where they can combine into the larger uh, worm if they need to say battle another worm and so you have this kind of dichotomy of you're playing a portion of a larger beast and everyone's individuals but at the appropriate kind of adventure in the moment that the drama you can form together if you have this external threat you're going to be fighting against there so yeah certainly highlander is a, is a big reference for this type of scenario setup mm -hmm. and that does bring me to a question given the given the fact that dragons are driven to um are, dri are driven to fight each other and consume each other's hearts and thus gain um each other's powers um what is the what is the impetus for a gr for a group of dragons to be to be in to be in some sort of adventure even even if it's a one shot and not try and, and not 
try and kill each other or have a we'll kill each other later kind of mindset. Right, and, that, and that's where this particular scenario, while it does have that cannibalistic aspect of it, all the players are playing the same, what we call Sundermake. So when, when a worm, a giant worm, which is kind of a combined player character, they can break into their individual pieces, as I mentioned. It's called Sundering. And so they to the individual dragons. And so everyone in the same, the player characters are all Sundermates. They're all portions of this one beast. So you wouldn't get infighting other than you know normal party infighting, you wouldn't get infighting amongst the individual characters because you're all part of the same beast. It's your beast, your group is going to be against the other people's group. So there could be another three or four or five uh, dragons that are part of a different worm. And so your group of four or five dragons of the player characters are going to be in conflict. I won't say necessarily fighting because while, while yes, that to drive and desire like in Highlander to, you know, seek out your opponents and to battle them and, and then hopefully eat their heart to gain their power. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that you can play to a game where, you know, how do you interact with humanity? For example, uh, you know, humans are insignificant compared to dragons and yet they can make very interesting scenarios on how to play. You can get involved in the human world if you want to, or maybe you're you're not playing in the human world. You're playing just in the the dragon scale world. But what kind of threats can come up on the dragon scale world? And that's some of the things that we cover in the game. Of you know, it's there's not a lot of games where you're playing actual dragons. You may be playing, say, in Dungeons and Dragons, you're playing dragon kin. You're playing. Uh, a portion of a dragon or a half dragon or someone who's worm-like, lizard-like, but these are you're actually playing these gigantic 22-meter beasts, uh, and it's a very different scenario when you're actually playing the dragon itself. When you're so powerful, the only real threat against you are going to be other dragons. Mm -hmm. I will admit that the closest game I can think of to something like this and even th even this is a massive massive stretch was fireborn um and even and even then that w that still falls into that not quite a full dr not quite a full dragon kind of thing since the gimmick with it is that you were playing um the re the reincarnation of a dragon and having flashbacks to to the old days when you were a full dragon right so yeah, with this one, you're just straight up playing playing a dragon. It's mm -hmm. not a common setting, uh, and, and and player character types. You know, when you're the further you away, move away from humanoid types, sometimes you can get some distance from the role playing. Because if you're playing a human or, or an elf or a dwarf, like they're, they're humanoid. But as soon as you start varying too far, it's difficult to kind of get into their mindset. So how do you how do you get into the mindset of what, what an actual dragon would play like? And it, it is difficult, but we thought that was an interesting part of the challenge. And at the kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of the pixies, where you are the weak ones and you're struggling to just get by and get a house, uh, you know, find a place to live, where on the worms, you, you can... Do just about anything. Humanity is irrelevant to you, uh, or as irrelevant as you want them to be. You can have your allies if you want, and in humanity, you can interact with them. But you are the the apex, and the only other apex predator threat is another one of your kind. And so, yeah, it was a it was a very different type of setting, but I thought one that was an interesting thing to explore. And uh, you know, the idea of, kind of that splitting apart and then combining that was very much from the, the drama of, you know, these giant fighting robots and either it's, you know, some Voltron or maybe even Rangers. Uh, like it just had this, this real end of, end of scenario setting where you'd come together to have the final battle and then it's over and then you'd have your feast and you gain, adv you know, advancement points because you're eating the hearts of your enemies and that's how you gain in power. And given, given that would, it would be, e I could easily see someone saying that um, worms would be leaning more to, would be leaning more towards one shots than extended campaigns. Is that so, is do you do you foresee that kind of thing with worms, or do you think it can handle um, multi session campaigns? Yeah, that that's actually a, a great question. I would tend to think from you know, just the way where I play. Of course, everyone can different that I look at something that's maybe a little bit more comedy bent, like Pixies. 
I actually can see that being a really good for unconnected one shots where you can play a one shot and you do this thing. And then maybe in a week or a month or whatever period of time you get together and you, you play another one shot, they can be completely different characters or the same characters, uh, but you don't need that continuity. But I actually think with the worms, it has this this almost not tragic, but this dramatic story aspect to it that I can actually see this being a maybe not a full campaign that would last for two or three years but but certainly maybe a, a mini campaign and i think it really plays out to that really well uh, but but that's how i would play it certainly you can play it with one shots but i think the idea of how do you explore what does it mean to be a dragon and uh what kind of relationship do you have with there are so few worms in the entire world and yet you're drawn to to fighting and destroying your own kind eventually there's only going to be one and 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 that's going to be lonely at that point. If you were the only worm slash dragon left in the world, uh, you know, how, what kind of fulfillment is that? And, and how do you interact with, with the incredible numbers of elves and dwarves and humans that are around? There's, there's hundreds of thousands of these other creatures who are beneath you. And do you want any kind of connection with them? And I, I think that's actually a very interesting thing to explore, which you could unfold over many different sessions. Yeah. Now, and although it, although um I would I will admit that if I ran worms there would be temptation to throw in a bit of queen into into my game soundtracking. <laughs> <laughs> but when it comes but when it comes to the mechanic end of things now you met, now you had already mentioned that Pixies is 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 isn't too far removed from Prime um Tristat. But how um how 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 far removed would worms be um comparatively? Yeah, worms is is also fairly close in in a slightly different way. It mm -hmm. it does scale differently, obviously, uh, be, because it is so much bigger, mm -hmm. and you're playing really really powerful characters, and then so the range of what you know the the let's just say the most capable pixie and the least capable pixie. It's going to be a much more narrow range than if you had the most capable worm versus the least. The the power levels of spells that different dragons, some dragons have magic and they can use magic spells. And the range of those power levels is greater as well. So if you looked at the character sheets that we'd have, that you would have more dots to fill in on something like worms because, mm -hmm. because it does expand out to a, a greater uh, scope. Now, partially because of that, skills play a, a different role where in pixies you will choose a skill and then you have you can have different levels in that skill hmm. where worms you either have the skill or you don't and it's not a level based thing it's like yes i have performance as a skill or i have uh herbalism or lore this is just something that i can do and because of the the scope of what you're playing at is so powerful that you don't have to worry about you know how how good of lore do you have or how much uh, herbalism do you have we don't worry about the scope of there so it, it plays it scopes differently i guess is what it comes down to is that you you it turns skills into a a checkbox as opposed to a power levels uh scope where you can vary on how powerful you are so tristat is still very familiar in worms it it changes most when we get to demonicity but mm -hmm. it would it would seem to be a in an abbreviated powered version in worms that's kind of takes the the scope of what we have and narrows it because of the power scope it is which is why it's going to be a little different than than pixies pixies is definitely going to be the most familiar to best of players mm -hmm. um that that brings me to two aspects that i that are obviously going to be the highlights in a worms campaign um the first is the first is the whole fusion dif fusion diffusion thing and the se and the second is um con is consuming hearts. Um, I'd like to go in I'd like to go into the first one of the of those two and how th how that kind of thing is reflected mechanically since combina since combination type um type motifs are always a tricky and sometimes crunchy affair to you to utilize. 
Yeah. So in worms, it's actually very straightforward from, uh, you know, how the mechanistic is presented. So in a normal game, everyone has their own dragon character sheet. Mm -hmm. But then in addition, there is one other character sheet, which is a combined character sheet of all the players when they get together. So you'd have one worm character sheet, which would be at a significantly different power scale. So if everyone is built normally, their dragons are 100 points and you'd have a a campaign, your dragon, your worm might be 240 points. Mm-hmm. versus 100 like so much more powerful so much more capable because these are the the giant beasts but there's only going to be one of those character sheets and so how do you role play when when there's one you're all playing the same character and that is a, is an area that's is somewhat i wouldn't say experimental but certainly stretches the boundaries of what people are familiar and comfortable with whenever you're doing your role playing and that is something that comes out which is why you're not going to be playing most of the game in, in worm form you're going to be mostly your individual dragons and then you will get together when you need to but there's this desire to be separate uh, which is why the sundering, you know, the splitting up happens into the individual character pieces, because this is not really a, a game about the giant beast. This is a game of what what when, what happens when this beast divides into pieces and how do they interact with each other and interact mm-hmm. with the world. Now, when it comes to the consumption of hearts, how would that how would that reflect in the mechanics end of things? Is it a case where heart consumption grants some of the abilities of the defeated dragon? Or is it something else? Yeah, so we we keep it usually quite quite simple on on the presentation, and that's to avoid uh, trying to tell people what they should be doing with the game. Like, for example, you might see in some fiction where you know you you defeat someone and you get their abilities. For example, we don't play it that way. What we do instead is the characters gain additional points. And so if you're a hundred point character and you're all hundred point characters and you manage, and maybe just one of the characters, well, like one of the dragons, I were playing in a group. I managed to defeat one of my dragon rivals that I consumed their heart. So I would get five extra points instead of my hundred. I'm now 105 points. And so those extra points are your advancements. That's like going up your levels or whatnot. And not everyone may be advancing at the same time, but if, of course, in a normal game, and you think of whether it's comics or uh, you know any kind of opposition, there's almost always one opponent for every player. And so eventually, the assumption is going to be that there's going to be equal advancement as you go forward. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you can, uh, with, with advancement points, you can increase your stats or your attributes levels. You can uh, you kind of do whatever you want with it rather than saying, oh, I ate someone that could tell time or tell the future. Therefore, I got the future telling power. We don't put those restrictions on it, just in case you want to play it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Now, one per- one um one particular one particular setup that I that always comes to mind when it comes to the idea of of um con- of controlling dr- of controlling dragons has always been the um the the Panzer Dra- the Panzer Dragoon series. Um, and I'm specifically thinking of or, of Orta um, in this. The reason why I bring that one up is because of the fact that within within that one, you had the option of sw- of switching between um, multiple multiple forms. And I'm curious if based if based on someone based on someone's attribute use, if that's some if that's something that could be utilized, or if it's a case of one form and then the fusion. Yeah, that's we don't have uh, any any kind of attribute based in the game about how to you know shape shift or you know we kind of don't play up on that aspect of it. Now there are spells that you can end up changing your shape and changing your form from a spell. Mm-hmm. So for example, you know the, the standard example of the dragon that turns into a human and interacts with someone and gives them a reward like that that type of aspect. We have magic that can that accomplish that, but that's not the the focus of the game isn't about the kind of dragons with multiple forms. Everyone has one form or you can unify together to create your worm. Yeah. Um I do remember I do remember in some of the in in the older days of tr- of Tristat in order to re- in order to represent a kind of scaling, different die sizes would be used. Um, yeah, Pri- Price at the X was what was the implementation that we brought at that point. That was yeah. our solution to the scaling. Um, now, when it comes to, because of the fact that Worms is obviously going to be on a higher scaling than than other entries, 
Um, is it going to be using the same the same die resolution, or is it going to be doing something different to reflect that sense of scale? Yeah, no, no. So it does use the same dice, and whenever we went from the old TriStat system, which was a roll under, mm-hmm. and which is why the DX, the the different dice size, made sense in a roll under game. But when we rolled over now, which is that's the new version of TriStat, we didn't need to vary the dice anymore because it just scales up appropriately. But what we did uh, on some things is we scaled things for the game, which they would then rescale if you were to try to make this fully compatible to TriStat. A simple example are are your your stats. So normal kind of human range when you're working with your stats, your body, mind, and soul, kind of in the 1 to 12 range is kind of where your normal uh, human range is. You know, an average human is a 4. Mm-hmm. Well, what we did in, in Worms is we kept the idea of this kind of 1 to 10, 1 to 12, but we doubled the effectiveness compared to TriStat base, compared to Bessel. And so in all of the, the games, whether it's Worms or the other ones, we provide a section about the integration with Bessem and how you do this and, and size categories of consideration where if everyone is approximately 30 meters long, well, that now becomes the default size as opposed to core Bessem, that would be much larger than default. What now that is default because everyone that you're playing is going to be that size. So we kind of almost change the center point from that. Mm-hmm. But then we also have the stats, as I mentioned. And so what we do is we double the cost of the stats. So now it's four points for an individual stat instead of two points the way it would be in Bessem as an example. But we've also changed the scale. So then now every stat point you'd have in Worms would be double the value of a stat point in base tri stat. And those are some of the scaling aspects that we did. We kept things very familiar and we provide an appendix in each of the games about Here's the consideration if you're integrating with Bessem. Here's how we change the game in case people do want to bring things in. Because that's certainly the advantage, the, the real advantage of working with a single system is that integration across all platforms. And White Wolf, certainly with the World of Darkness, that was was groundbreaking, uh, I think, as you know, the vampires and the mages and the werewolves and all using the same system. And then you can bring them in the same game, even though they were completely separate games, you can use them together. And that's what we envision, not that we're, we're saying people have to be anime worms or superhero worms and integrate those games that we have. But at least that option is there that if someone wants to take what we presented in, in worms or demonicity or pixies and then bring in other elements from uh, Big Eye Small Mouth that we didn't do, there's a way to do it. And we provide that guidance in the game. Yeah, I remember, I remember that being relatively easy to do with Old World of Darkness, New World of Darkness. It was still doable, but you're going to have to do a little bit more work. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I and mean, then that could be. I mean, certainly, I know my my most familiarity is with the with the original World of Darkness, and mm-hmm. I thought that that cross integration that was one of the inspirations actually for doing the TriStat system and and making it as a universal system uh, with different games is rather than a universal system and a bunch of expansions or supplements, which kind of like the, the GURPS and the hero method was more like that, where you had the core system and everything fed into that. I like the idea of different games using the same system as a base that could integrate with each other. If you're bringing in GURPS, you forgot the calculus textbook. <laughs> I, I love I love GURPS, but um, the freedom to do just about anything comes with a cost, and that is um, crunch. It, it does, you know, absolutely, and that's one of the, that's why these tri stack games. You yes, you'd lose that flexibility of doing everything. It's still tri stack, but because we removed that flexibility and then have something very focused, we removed a lot of the crunch as well. Mm-hmm. Which for people who are looking for something to be highly accessible, this is those games for it. Which I, I can see that because. Something that I've talked with you a few a few times um, in the in the past has been the han- been the handling and mitigation of analysis paralysis and with something like this something like this because everything's right there in front of you and is relatively fast to look to look up that's not as much of a factor. It's still going to be a factor, just not as just not as big of an issue. Right. Um, but that brings me to demonicity. Um. Now this this of course is the thir- this of course is the third in this particular trinity, and once again I'd ha- once again I have to I have to open with how this particular one got um, set up. Yeah, so the the kind of the origins for demonicity after I went big and you know, small and then big with pixies and worms, then demonicity came next, and in many ways this was inspired by a game that 
Guardians of Order, my old company, did uh, Demon City Shinjuku, which was an anime movie, and we did a licensed product for it. We ended up having you know a, an official Demon City Shinjuku game, and there's a lot of great uh, other genre movies that are like that where whether it's either wicked city or or buffy the vampire slayer even some aspects of say you know classic cthulhu mythology of demons uh, invading the, where you live if the demons invading the world from other dimensions coming in and how do you stop that and so we took some some inspiration from different ones and i mm -hmm. thought well what if we had this idea of this city which is a fallen city because there's these cultists, effectively, uh, trying to bring in a gateway in order to tell how allow a demonic, huge demon, you know, massive arch fiend from the hell dimensions, trying to get them to come through. And while that's going to take a long time, that's kind of like the, the game ender scenario, or the end of the movie would be the, the giant demon coming through. There's all the smaller demon servants that come through. And then, of course, there's the very capable cult. And then combining that with a almost like a like a strike force secret operatives types organization paramilitary that kind of runs on the side. It, you know, it's not an official CIA or, or any operative like that. But BPRD. You know, the, yeah, yeah. The, the, these demon hunters, these these operatives that have these special talents that have a group, and their job is to go into the demon city that we present that has fallen in order to gather information, rescue people, stop what's happening. Ultimately, the, the camp, if you ran with a campaign as opposed to a one shot, the big goal is to shut down the, the children uh, that we call them. Their, their, uh, Sagalor is the name of the, the giant demon mm -hmm. to shut down that demon and thus get rid of the cult. That's the ultimate goal so that the demon doesn't come through. But there's so many different things you can play in. If you watch some of these movies and, and shows that are kind of inspired where demonicity comes from, there's lots of different things you can do during the game. You can have a whole game where you're just, you know, inside the demon city dealing with people living there. And, and how do they, you know, when, when you know you're in a bad land and you're in, in, you know, the Hellmouth and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, or you're in... Uh, Shinjuku in Demon City Shinjuku and you're living in there and that uh, how do you how do you get by and how do you survive and there's a lot of opportunities for investigation for certainly for combat but it's it's a slightly different feeling because you are going to be playing either humans or near humans like some of the characters can have these demon like powers maybe they're half demons mm -hmm. for example and so there's this this bleed over and so the, you're going to be playing characters who are more human but they have this this noble goal of saving the world. Yeah. And I think it I think it would be I think it would be pertinent to note that as from what I under, from what I understand of this, while while there could be the while there could be the assumption based on appearance of a post apocalypse, this is not a post apocalyptic game. Yeah, no, definitely not. This is effectively modern world. Mm -hmm. Uh let's assume it's it's modern enough of a world but there's a city that's yeah you know, th think think of chernobyl as a, as a really simple analogy that chernobyl is this city that you can't go to anymore mm -hmm. because there was this accident that happened well demon city is very similar it's this area where there was uh, an earthquake and there was an event and there is that supernatural element but you know, not everyone needs to know that the average person doesn't understand that there's a supernatural element. So the city is is kind of a no travel zone in the city. The rest of the world continues on as it always has been. We, you know, our life over here isn't impacted by what happened with the fact that Chernobyl shut down. Yeah. Um, but if you took another city around the world, we, we don't name what the city is. We leave it kind of vague and, and urban. But you can determine if, if New York fell to a giant earthquake and the entire or, or a, a nuclear bomb went off in new york city and so the whole area was considered you know you can't go in here it's cordoned off the, the rest of the world would still keep going and so it's just this one area this one city now that said we also have the idea that these the this cult the uh a Sagalore, these children could be out in the other parts of the world trying to recruit information getting maybe getting artifacts that they need for their rituals uh, you could play a lot of this game outside of the demon city if you want mm. uh, that's certainly fine it's just that level of you are a part of that that operative network and we have it set modern day but of course if if people want to make this an, an ancient setting or a future setting uh, it's very 
cross genre in that sense. Uh, it's just the idea of the the big bad horror trying to break through the earth, yeah. and that's something that is you know very gameable. And even, um, I will admit that when you brought when you brought up Chernobyl and and the, and that particular analog, there was one there was one there was one story and one ga- and one game that that story inspired that um what that was chi- that was chief in that was chief in my head um in this regard even though it, even though it's going a bit more weird sf than 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 supernatural horror in in what you're doing um are you familiar with the are you familiar with the book roadside picnic no i haven't heard that one um that was now it it's one of those sto- it's one of those sto- it's one of those it's it's a very russian kind of story i'll put i'll put it that way um and it served as the inspiration for the Stalker series, which may or may mm. not be getting a sequel. Finally, it's really hard. It's really hard to tell. I mean, I mean, there was a there was a tease at there was a tease at E three this year, but who knows? <laughs> but when it comes, but the premise when it comes to st- when it comes to Stalker is that there are st- that um the area around Chernobyl was rechristened the Zone. And there are there are certain anomalies that can produce very rare and very valuable items within the zone. But being in there is dangerous because, well, it's Chernobyl, and the and the zone can just as easily create th- create things you don't want to deal with, who might try and kill you, or some of the other inha- some of the other factions when it comes to the inhabitants might try and kill you. So it's an e- it's an easy place to make a whole lot of money or get shot, or both. And yeah, that that sounds very very familiar. Uh, that that is, it's, it would be a great role playing place. Yeah, and obviously, obviously, I am vast. I am vastly oversimplifying Stalker. It is a, it is a fascinating thing to delve into, and it's a surpri- It's a bit of a surprise that there's been very few um, role playing att- role playing attempts. I I've heard of one, but that's but just one doesn't se- doesn't seem like it should be enough. Um, when it can, but given the, but given that um would it be would it be more would it be more appropriate to say that demonicity is a pre-apocalypse kind of story like you're in the you're in the... Uh, yeah absolutely you're you're right if it's pre-apocalypse in the sense that you have to stop the apocalypse from happening uh so that's the the pre-apocalypse when you're actually in the setting it can certainly feel apocalyptic if you're uh actually in that the the demon city itself and in in some ways if uh, something that recent came out of course uh, demonicity was was written before it but uh zach snyder's uh, new zombie movie the army of the dead Mm -hmm. where you know there's a zombie plague and las vegas has fallen and so the government roped in las vegas they put up a bunch of barriers so the the, all the zombies are in one city and you can go into that city you probably shouldn't but you can go into that city and that's going to feel like it's an apocalypse that's already happened because because in many ways for that location it has if you go into the demon city you're dealing with the fact that you're going to be running into demons and cultists and a world that has been shaken by earthquakes and you know explosions and and things that have happened because of this these attempts through the rituals to bring the demon through so that's going to be the apocalyptic setting but as soon as you step outside demon city then you're in the the regular world so to speak and that would be the pre-setting if of course the uh uh the the demon actually manages to come through yeah now you would now you've mentioned a couple times that that demonicity is the one is the one that's the most removed even though, but um, even though that's a bit of a stretch, me saying that, from the from the core um tristat setup and looking at the example character sheet on the on one of the updates, I can certainly I can certainly see that chief of, chief being um, you have a much higher cap than you di- when it comes to body, mind, and soul, um, concerning the, concerning how many points you can put into put into those stats, but. What? But what else? Do, what else does? Um, what else would you say that de- that demonicity do- is doing that's significantly different from the established sandbox of Tristat? Yeah, and so the the setting because you're going to be playing the let's just say paranormal or 
peak humans for some things. You're not gonna not playing normal people. What you're doing is you're you're playing people who are at the higher end of these uh, these abilities, and so you're going to have. Uh, your your body, mind, and soul can be higher than normal. You may be your, your partial demons, so you have enhanced uh, stats because of that. And and that certainly plays out on it. We also have an element that we brought into as an expansion option in Bathroom Extras for sanity. And this this is not part of base try stat, but in Bathroom Extras, the expansion, we did talk about this this sanity component that you know your your brain can it handle all of these aspects of what's going on with demons? And so we, we have that in the game. We, we brought in that uh, in, into the core. Mm -hmm. But then the, the big change comes from the attributes. And it's on some surface, it's going to be familiar to try that. It's not that different. But there's other aspects that definitely changed up. And that is dealing with, we now have a very tight attribute list of only uh, nine or 10 attributes. But then each attribute can have a uh, multiple foci or, or you know, multiple focuses mm -hmm. that they have. And so at each rank or level in this attribute, you get a new focus. So for something like, let's just take, uh, you know, resources. So this is something that you have, you're going to have a resource in the game. And what does that mean? Well, if you have it at rank three of your resources, then not only does it tell you something about, well, you're a rank three resource, but you, then you also have three different foci for that. Uh, and, you know, the, one of the characters we present as an example that they have connected, they have a human ally, and they have transportation. So these are very diverse aspects. Or resources is kind of a, a big level that wraps up access of things that you have that can help you. And so connected would be an organization that you're tied to. Could it be a police force, for example? Uh, another resource could be a human ally. So there's someone that's in Demon City, whether maybe it's a, a business owner that lives in the Demon City, and they're an ally, so they can feed you information. And then transportation, one of the characters, he just has a kind of like an old time motorcycle that he rides around in Demon City, and that is his resource. It's called transportation. So these we brought up a, an interesting way of covering a massive diversity of options because when you think if, if you were going to bring in characters that first of all like ultimate high level special op types uh, ideas and then you bring in the potential for uh mystical supernatural paranormal if you bring in those we wanted to make sure we covered a wide range but none of them are did we want to go into great detail on because that's not what the game is about the game is about the the struggle and the operations that you're going to have to go out and, and stop what's happening but we wanted to make sure that we gave you this option of having it's like oh i, I want to have this ability to be invisible sometimes and maybe i want to be really good at fighting with multiple weapons and maybe i can touch people i can mimic their powers if i can touch a demon i can gain the demon powers mm -hmm. but these are all a more individual checkboxes as opposed to a spectrum of what they can do. And so this system of attributes with foci, that is, was the, a big deviation from what traditional TriStat is. It doesn't change it in a negative way. It just shows you TriStat as, as a core foundation. It's that toolbox and what you can do with it mm -hmm. is, is incredibly diverse. And so that's where that big change comes from. Yeah. Um, now, given, given the fact that the, that the, um, that the, that the, that the abilities pre present here are not are um, putting aside the foci are not ex are not exactly as much of a one as much of a one to one as the as the ones in in um try in what I'm gonna call TriStat Prime um, until I can come up with a better name um, I'd like to I'd like to go down each of them and just and just get just get just have you give me an idea on what on what its general um, umbrella would be within the within the rules. Sure, yeah, yeah, we can we can cover that. So I'll start at the top with adaptability. Yeah, so adaptability is think of this as kind of the um, kind of a assets that serves you under a very dynamic situation. Like for example, a demon body mm -hmm. could be very diverse and adapt to a number of different extreme environments. So this could be something from elasticity to gills and visibility, shape shifting, uh, camouflage, like these, a lot of these are going to be, while you can have it as a, as a regular human, some aspects of it, very small aspects, uh, a lot of them are going to also be only appropriate if you have that paranormal aspect. Like if, if you can shapeshift, that's not something you can do unless you have demon blood in some form, right? Because that's, that's not what normal human can do. But that's what, what adaptability would be. Yeah. 
Um, damage. Yeah, damage is, is fairly straightforward. That is a way of indicating how much damage you do. But it's not just about uh, like a strict one point. Uh, because it could be when you're dealing with the foci, that's where you can bring in, well, maybe it's you have exorcism. Maybe you, you, uh, you're, you're a demon type that can spread things with diseases or toxins. Uh, maybe it's psychic damage or you're draining stats or maybe you can um, you know, incapacitate people. Like These are different ways of focusing what damage can do as opposed to just straight up, I do four points of damage and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, demonicity. Yeah, demonicity is kind of the, the much bigger catch-all, that everything under demonicity is only available to characters that have either infernal heritage or bloodlines or, or can call upon some sort of energies that are that are demon-driven. And these are your multiple diversities, whether it's being able to reincarnate or having super strength or maybe telekinesis, healing, growing, like all of those things you traditionally think of a, a straight-up paranormal ability. That is what demonicity is. And that's where... You know, the, the, the idea of this name, people like demonicity does not exist as a word. This is like elasticity or toxicity. It is kind of the expression of something. Demonicity is the expression of you being a demon. And that's where the title comes from. All right. Um, fighting. Yeah. So fighting you know, sounds straightforward. And of course, it very well can be something of, of melee or attacking, defending, but it also can bring in stuff like psychic or, uh, you know, being able to, to penetrate when you're fighting, maybe fighting multiple targets simultaneously. These are all different aspects of fighting. And so it's, that's what the different foci would, would come into play. Mm -hmm. um, knack. Knack would be kind of the, the non-supernatural parallel to demonicity. So these are uncanny talents that you might have, but they're not supernatural, like being able to decipher well, uh, you know, having a keen sense of smell, maybe recovering from your healing quickly, maybe having really, really good sight or being unassailable, like resisting the impacts of to your sanity, which is a mechanic in this game. Maybe you're very difficult to, to kind of have that impact on your mind. So these will all be the knacks. These are the just the, the benefits that you have. Mm -hmm. Movement. Yeah, movement covers everything from being really fast to flying, teleporting, crawling on walls. It's it's anything that's movement related can be a foci in the game. All right. Resistance. Uh, so resistance is your resilience against injury, you know, typically related to the, the types of attack, whether it's, you know, you might have armor mm -hmm. or maybe your resistance to diseases or poisons or radiation. Maybe you, uh, you know, pressure, for example, mm -hmm. high pressure, or maybe you're just really tough. You effectively would have a lot of health. Mm -hmm. These are the different foci that would be under resistance. All right. Resources. Yeah, I talked a little bit about resources. These are your either your, your tangible assets, your your social currency that's going to be in the game. They might not involve dice rolling uh, as way some of the other ones were. Like if you have, for example, transportation, if you have a vehicle, um, then then you might not be doing rolls involving that. Or maybe you have a lot of cash. You just you have a lot of money, or you're connected to people. Mm -hmm. But it's something that represents those 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 social aspects that can come up during the adventure. Mm -hmm. And skills. Yeah, skills are fairly straightforward, obviously. You know, this is not unlike other aspects of the, the other games that we have, and certainly Core Tristat, where just the higher level of skill you have is the more uh, skill general areas. Now, these aren't specific skills, so we don't have the difference of, oh, well, I have a chemistry skill uh, and a physics skill and a biology skill. You know, you would just take your scientific skill. So this is more like the skill groups that we have in Core Bessem, the, the original Tristat skill groups as opposed to the individual skills, because in, in this game, it's not about the individual skills because you're dealing on a level that's kind of beyond human as opposed to uh, in Pixies. We wanted those individual skills because that plays up uh, like being very good at something very focused made sense for that genre where demonicity was like, well, you're a scientist. It doesn't matter if you're a physicist or a chemist. You're just a scientist. Therefore, you have that that skill group, which we just call skill group. Now, one thing one thing that I found kind I found kind of interesting in the design of the sh of the sheet is instead of instead of representing the 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 particular um the particular dots on uh, on attributes through 
um, well, dots, you instead used a meter setup. Yeah, it seemed to be something I, we wanted to to emphasize with all the three TriStack games and, and future ones mm -hmm. was just that there is no one single way to do something. So here's some different diversity that we had. And if you were to look at some of our older games that we did previously that were TriStack, we did the Authority role-playing game, which was a superhero game based on the Authority comic series that DC published. Mm -hmm. So that one, we gave these bar power bars. Uh, for the character. If you think of superheroes, often I think of kind of a spectrum of a power scale where it goes from, you know, the, the one color maybe green and then it goes into orange and then it goes into red and then, you know, that type of power scale, bar-like like presentation as opposed to discrete dots. And that seemed to be what I was going for with Demonicity, that I like that idea of, of, a, of a power bar that you'd see getting more intense and more intense as it got bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And I thought that showing it in this way shows the diversity of yeah it's it's not it, there's not one right way to do tristat it's it's a core framework then you can then customize to do what you want and, and i like the idea of doing the bars here I, I i missed it from back doing the authority i thought that was a great way of presenting the superheroes back then on on you know which of the characters from the comic series are more powerful than others in different categories and we had these bars indicating their powers. I, I thought this was a great presentation for what I wanted in Demonicity. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that kind of thing up because what immediately comes to mind is is the brief flirtation for a few years that Marvel tried to do with codifying the power levels of all the characters in their universe through the right. uh, power grid system that they had done. Yes, and and that is you know, at any time you're going to have in the geek f fandom, right? You're going to have characters that have different abilities, whether it's the Hulk or Spider Man or whatnot. You want a number that goes along with them, like, well, what number is the Hulk in this versus Spider Man versus Captain America? So I can understand why they'd want to have things codified in that way. It, it doesn't always work, especially in comics where you know there, there's not one true presentation of Spider Man or Superman or whoever. There's there's a wide range of them, but I can understand that that desire to have that comparison yeah I, th I think it's i think it's also the reason the whole um power level thing in Dr in dragon ball z didn't last uh, yeah i was mean, very difficult to take take a, a series or a media property with it's, if it's an anime or a comic or a movie which are designed to be created from to make a good narrative and then put numbers to them as because what, what we're doing with games is we're tr traditionally we're numbers first Mm -hmm. And then then you have the, the narrative on top of that, where media properties, they don't worry about the numbers, which when you're working with a license, and I've worked on many of them, that is part of the frustration is a, trying to translate a particular movie or TV series into a role playing game. They don't always play nice because they're not concerned about the numbers the way gamers are. Yeah. Um, it's, and I think I think it's I think it's also the reason why. um Oh, for instance, the whole thing with the power grid, that was a thing that started that I first saw in the I first saw in the late nineties, and I haven't really seen it since. Um and when it com and when it comes to when it comes to try when it comes to trying do doing that in con in conversion, I think that's the reason why broad tiers are are often used and it's in my own experience when trying to convert characters from various IPs to tabletop, I've used I've used bro I've used broad bullet point like tiers instead instead of tr instead of trying to use hard and fast numbering. Um, yes. But one of one one thing that I that I did that I do not see, unless unless it's on a separate spot, in the demonicity plate um, character sheet, is mm -hmm. defects. Right, and they they just don't exist in the game. I, that was a decision that. Um, the focus on these getting these point backs by having these disadvantages. Uh, the assumption of demonicity is that everyone has baggage. You're you're playing part of a, a group, obviously, and you're you're part of a team. And the, the the use of defects. This is the first time we've taken it out of a game. It just didn't really seem to to have a space for that because. Uh, I don't know, maybe it just wasn't the focus when I was going for the idea and running through what these characters are. A lot of these characters are going to have baggage that they come along with, but this type of baggage just didn't seem to be mechanistically important. And so you can say, oh, I, you know, I have this problem. I have this problem, whatever, whatever they are. 
and that's fine, but you, we don't have a rule for it. And I mm -hmm. thought that that seemed right for demonicity. People can bring in defix if they wanted. It just didn't seem to be ne necessary with the way we presented the game. I can kind of, I can kind of see that. And I'd like my re my reasoning. I may be on, I may be on similar uh, wavelength with with you for this, but I've always seen it that the value of a def a defect is giving the GM a bone of of saying. I may reward you for this afterwards, but this is something that is going to work that the GM is going to be using against you. And what and not I don't mean in an adversarial sense, but more in a may you live in interesting times kind of sense. And when it comes and when it comes to a lot of the when it comes to a lot of those de defects that are in um that are that are in tri that are in Tristat Prime based on the premise that you have with de with demonicity where you have people who are supposed to be competent but with ba but with baggage um it there's not a whole there's not a whole lot of them that would really fit within that archetype yeah i mean i i think that's kind of a good feeling for it uh certainly you can take any disadvantage and you can say oh well you know my character is hounded or cursed or um, you know, I have, a, I have a physical disadvantage or maybe a, a mental disadvantage. You could you could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, bl I'm blind or I can't feel because I've lost my sense of touch. It just seems like maybe those didn't need to be codified with a, with a system in this particular expression of the game. And I, I think that could work. But again, at the same time, that's the advantage of the, the, the beauty of having this being a tri-stack game. You want to bring in the entire defect system from any other tri-stack stack game into Demonia, so you can do it. We just didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. Um, now, you, you, had mentioned, you had mentioned the possibility of playing humans or near humans, um, whether, whether, they be ha whether they be half demons or, some, or something else. Um, what I'm curious about with that is how much does that change when it comes to so when it comes to someone's um, stat allocate stat allocation or how how they're going to be spending points and so on. It, it only changes in the sense of how you see the expression of your character. Like certainly, um, demonicity as the one attribute that I've mentioned is specific to demon powers. If you said I'm I'm playing a normal human, then the, the GM would say reasonably you can't have any demonicity attributes them because you're a normal human you don't have access to being invisible or, or you have camouflage skin if you don't have demon blood you cannot have camouflage skin mm -hmm. but in terms of how you see your your stats playing out if you think well i'm i'm basically uh, a jean-claude van damme type uh you know an, an elite athlete and so i have a you know really really high body stat more than the average person you don't need to be supernatural to to be a gymnast character, for example, or someone who's a a crack detective, um, or maybe a a priest, uh, like a I guess a more fictional priest that is in tune with what's going on and kind of understands the, the workings of the world. Maybe you, you do have access to some so some power paranormal magic. You you studied the occult. And so you can choose where these different aspects go. If you want to have a drop of demon blood, or you want to be a you know a half a full on half demon from these this demon land that who has has decided that he doesn't like what they are doing to, in order to break in the the giant archfiend, you recognize that um, Sagor bringing him through would be a terrible decision for the earth. And so you've joined up with the the, you know, the humans to fight against the demons. But we don't tell you what stats you need to do, where you, where you focus want to be. It'd be whatever expression of your character would be reasonable. Mm -hmm. Now, with with all with all that in, with all that in mind, is am I correct in assume am I correct in assuming that for every um, every level that you that you have in an attribute, you also gain one foci? Yeah, that that's exactly what it is. So you gain uh, kind of overall power, like you would, like someone who is a a level one versus a level four that indicates two different things one it indicates overall scope within that attribute but then it also gives you additional foci so i guess a, a character who had level one resources money or a character that had level four resources and had four foci and one of those foci was cash that person would have more cash than the person that only had a level one and only had the money foci because it, it operates on a on a multiple scale it's two different scales that they have with the same attribute and again that's something we've never done in tristat before and we thought that that was a the right expression of what we wanted in this game it just really simplifies the you don't have to have levels for every single foci that you're dealing with mm -hmm. now 
with all, with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the for the project? Yeah, so once the the Kickstarter ends in a week, kind of you know first week in August, and then as normal, it takes a few weeks to get everything sorted out. And where we plan to send the files off to press at the end of August, the games are pretty well ready to go. You know, final editing and and making sure everything's is taken care of. But if they go off to press at the end of August, then it's very likely that kind of beginning of the year that the backers would receive their Kickstarters, and then it'll be in stores. Mm -hmm. sometime shortly thereafter that the the pdfs would be out sooner that's one of the, the advantages of a role-playing game versus say a board game where you do your kickstarter for a board game and then you wait six months and you have nothing for those six months where you know our role-playing products we can fulfill the at least the pdfs much sooner and so that would be fulfilled within say a month of, of what we're working on but there's still some things up in the air with what's going on with covid and how that's impacting shipping and factories and we hope that things aren't going to you know take a turn for the worse obviously it is, you know that would be independent of the gaming industry but mm -hmm. there there's some big global challenges that are kind of beyond our control but if everything goes as we expect then we'd be looking at the beginning of the new year's when the games will be out yeah i get, i can i can certainly get behind that and i, I will i will be um Looking, I'll be looking forward to seeing how how these th how these things uh, develop. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the w come all the way to the temple and enjoy and partake in the particular brand of craziness that happens around here every day. Well, you know, I every time you have me on, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about what we're doing. I'm, I'm certainly excited about the, this particular project. It's, it's much smaller in scale than what we've done in the past with best and fourth edition relaunch and for anime 5e, but I think it's a, it's a really interesting project. So, uh, you know, thanks for, for having me out to, to talk about this. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, whether, whether it's, to, whether it's for, for, whether it's for further, um, explorations with, tr with Tristat or to, or to or to laugh at the dice gods being merciless because they hate because the dice gods hate everyone <laughs> the door is always open as i often say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged and of and of course a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>